Okay, guys, we're starting a brand new time period uh, from 1800 to 1848. So basically, we're going through Jeffersonian democracy, Jackson, a uh, uh, new type of democracy, the common man, and we will be going up to the Mexican War. So this is Jeffersonian democracy from 1801 when he is inaugurated, inaugurated in March through 1809, and a lot of stuff going on with Jefferson, and uh, he is an interesting So remember, he was uh, going in agrarian. This is a revolution. So this is now a two-party republic, uh, federalist against the Democratic Republicans, and, and you'll see quite often they just say Republicans don't. Don't confuse that with the Republican Party, which starts under our 16th president, Lincoln. Yes, he was known uh, affectionately, nicknamed the Red Fox. When you are looking at um, rankings of U.S. presidents, this is from 2009, when they are ranking... Um, Ranking, I'm sorry, Theodore Roosevelt, I mean, sorry, good Lord, Thomas Jefferson, you see he is ranked number seven here in 2009. I need to update that survey. I think he has moved uh, down to number eight, and Dwight Eisenhower has moved up to seven. So they call it a revolution of 1800 because it is a peaceful transfer of power between two, two different parties. And that's the significance. Uh, we're going from Federalist to uh, Democrat-Republican, and yet there is no civil war, there is no violence. And let's hope that happens to us in January, okay? In his inauguration speech, he says, we are all Republicans. Now, that didn't change people um, still being very anti uh Jefferson, and you still have that Hamiltonian federalism. You can see uh, Voltaire and Paine on this altar of French Revolution and depotism. Um, he's burning the Constitution. I mean, this is um, this is just a, a, a federalist cartoon indicating that the nation is in trouble now that Jefferson is president. Um, again, this is one that shows Sally Hemming here, and uh, it gets very contentious when we have our next election, and Sally Hemings is uh, his slave. His wife had passed away. He never remarried, and he had a very long relationship with Sally Hemming, several children that's been proved by DNA. And you can see here, um, it says the philosophic cock. The cock was a symbol of revolutionary France. And Jefferson, of course, is a Francophile. So this is the election of 1800, and you can see that Adams is pretty soundly defeated in this uh, election, 73 to 65. He takes of the, the New England states and Jefferson takes pretty much um, all of the southern states as well as New York State. So this is kind of the history of uh, major parties. You have the Democratic Republicans, Jefferson's a Hamiltonian uh, Federalist, and then we go through this period of time that they call the period, the era of good feelings with um, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, and John Quincy Adams, and then that evolves into the Democratic Party with uh, Jackson and the National Republicans, and which evolve into the Whigs, and that is Henry Clay will be talking about them. And the Whigs evolve into Republicans, Party of Lincoln, and that is our present. We have uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, and of course we have a bunch of little third parties in there messing it up for the other parties. So Jefferson becomes president, but he keeps a lot of the Federalist policies. Um, he, he realized that the financial system needed to be retained. He's going to keep most of the people who had worked for the government that were Federalist. 
and he didn't want to upset the nation too much. He is going to make some major uh, first thing he's going to do is all those folks that Adams had thrown in jail for libel. Uh, he, he got them out of jail. He's going to change it back to from 14 years to five years for citizenship. And that whiskey tax, he is going to repeal Hamilton's whiskey tax. He's also going to uh, have as his Secretary of Treasury a guy named Albert Gallatin. And he is going to reduce the national debt and balance the budget. For a time, for a time, okay. How does he do that? He reduces the size of the military, and he is going to um, make a few changes as far as officers of the military, replacing them with Republicans. Okay, uh, no more property tax. That graduated property tax. He is a states' right guy, and nation. We've talked about that. Okay, so the 12th Amendment is going to be passed in 1804, probably because of the uh, disaster when Jefferson and Burr, the presumed vice presidential candidate, tied in the election of 1800. And when they tied, now Burr should have stepped down, and we had that in the presentations. Burr didn't step down. It was a mess. Uh, that's when Hamilton got involved and said that he didn't like Jefferson's character, but at least he had some character. And that was the uh, start of the slurs between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. So the Con House of Representatives have to break the tie, and Hamilton is throwing his weight behind Jefferson, even though he doesn't like Jefferson. One of the most important uh, chief justices the most important Chief Justice in U.S. history is John Marshall. And John Marshall is going to be appointed Chief Justice by John Adams. Um, he is a cousin of Thomas Jefferson, and actually they hated one another. He is going to keep Federalist principles on the court for 30 years. Be the background on Marbury versus Madison. Uh, the Judiciary Act of 1801 uh, had to do with federal judges being appointed, and the midnight judges, that's a term for as Adams is going out of office, he is appointing a whole bunch of Federalist judges. So watch Hip Hughes, and he will explain it. Hey guys, welcome hey guys, to Hip History. 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 We're hitting you up with the biggest Supreme Court of them all, and that's Marbury versus Madison. Three There's three reasons you need, need to know it. Number one, one it's going to be on the touch, touch I promise number you. Two, number two, you're not allowed, allowed to talk about power judicial power if you don't know Marbury versus Madison. And number, and number three, three, what an awesome story. story. It's a pretty cool story. Here we go, video. Marbury versus Madison So here's the story. It's a pretty cool story. We have the election of 1800, also called the Revolution of 1800, because in a sense we have really uh, a transfer of political power going from the Federalists to the Democratic Republicans. And of course in 1800 we have Thomas Jefferson who is elected. But the story gets interesting, not with the election of Jefferson, but with the period between the election and the actual taking of oath of office, which is on March 4th of 1801. So we have kind of this, what's called the lame duck session, really in the beginning of 1801, where you have John Adams and a Federalist Congress. Remember, Adams is a Federalist, and you have a Federalist Congress, and they're still in charge of making and signing laws. We haven't switched the dates yet to January 20th. So during this lame duck session, they go a little bit cray cray. They're going to pass a law which is called the Judiciary Act of 1801, an extension of the Judiciary Act of 1789, which really is going to create new districts 
district courts, and new circuit courts, and new justices of the peace. This is a position that wasn't even in the original Constitution. Um, and they're going to do that in order for John Adams on March 3rd, the day before Jefferson comes to town. Jefferson's all like, yo, go to the White House. And in the office the night before, Adams is like on the phone, like, yo, you want to be a judge? These are called the Midnight Judges. And he ends up uh, appointing 16 circuit judges and 42 justices of the peace. One of them is, you're getting ready, you've been waiting for it. William Marbury, right? We've got half the story, Marbury versus Madison. So this judge, Marbury, is all excited. The next day he's like, I'm going to be a judge. I'm going to know you're not. So this, is so this is where the story gets interesting. So on March 4th, the day that Thomas Jefferson's going to take his oath of office, right? He's getting ready. He's like, getting ready. Here we go. You actually have John Marshall. Remember that name because he's been appointed to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but he hasn't taken that job yet. You know what job he has? He's still the Acting Secretary of State for John Adams. You want to know what his job is? His job is to give these appointments out to get these judges confirmed. It goes to the Senate. It comes right back to John Marshall, and he's running around like a madman, like handing out judgeships. And then, alas, the clock strikes Jefferson. And Jefferson takes over without all of the judgeships. I don't know if that's a word. Without all of the judgeships, I'm going to say it again, being given out. And guess who didn't get their judgeships? Just guess. I guess you have a million choices. No, you know it. It's William Marbury. And now we have a new man in town. Yo, TJ's in town. So Jefferson wakes up the next day and he's like, what the heck has happened, Adams? What are you doing? This is crazy. And Adams is like, yo, dig it. You got to give these judgeships out. And Jefferson is like, dig it? No. And he orders his uh, acting secretary of state, who's a guy by the name of Levi Lincoln, which is a really cool name for being at 1801, by the way. Um, and later, his secretary of state, get ready, you're going to be excited about this one. It's going to be James Madison. Madison. And they're basically, they're basically going to refuse to give these commissions out. They're going to say, we're not going to do it. We think that the 1801 Judiciary Act is complete poop poop. I said poop poop. And they're actually going to get the new Democratic Republican Congress to pass the Judiciary Act of 1802, which got rid of the Judiciary Act of 1801 and also canceled the Supreme Court for a whole year. What are you doing? But nevertheless, we have our situation now where um, you're going to have William Marbury going to the high court, who's run now by John Marshall, who was the guy who didn't get to give him his job because the time ran out. It's a pretty cool story. So the decision comes down in 1803. It's actually a 4 nothing decision. 1803 because they canceled 1802. And John Marshall, again, he's the guy who didn't get to give William Marbury his commission. Time ran out. Is now ruling on the matter. And here's what he comes up with. He says, you got to know two things first. You got to know Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, Clause 2, which is really the judicial power that the Constitution gives to the court. It gives them something called original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction just means that this would be where you would go directly to the Supreme Court, ambassadors and cases that involve states. And really, there's very few instances of original jurisdiction. And then it talks really about appellate jurisdiction, that they're going to hear court cases that arise from the lower courts where there's some sort of dispute. And that really is the extent of judicial power. Nowhere in there does it give the court exclusive right to declare laws passed by Congress to be unconstitutional. But then he goes on to say, you got to know something else. you got to know about the Judiciary Act of 1789, which these guys were amending the Judiciary Act of 1801, the Judiciary Act of 1802. And in the Judiciary Act of 1789, you find the language where basically Congress has created a new piece of original jurisdiction. Basically what this clause says in the Judiciary Act of 1789 is that the Supreme Court will now have the power to order what's called writs of mandamus. And I could be butchering that. In but in this writ of mandamus, it's like a mandate from the court. They're now given permission to tell basically an executive department like Jefferson, you've got to give this guy his job. And basically what Marshall comes up with is three questions. He says, look, should William Marbury have gotten his job? Was that done legally? He goes, yes, yeah, he should have his job. He definitely should have his job. And did he do the right thing by coming to us? He said, yeah. He says, right there, Judiciary Act 1789, go to Supreme Court issue, everybody mandates, the right place, yeah. 
But number three, can the Supreme, can the Supreme Court enforce it? Can they tell the executive department through a writ of man, Damus, that they have to hire this guy, William Marbury? And what John Marshall says, and this is where he's going to make an enemy in William Marbury, is I can't give you your job because that's not in the original Constitution. The original Constitution is nothing about these writs of mandamus. This comes from expanding original jurisdiction that was done in the judicial jurisdiction. You, know, you can't do that. You can do that. Basically, we have a problem. We have a problem where you have a law passed by Congress and you have the words of the Constitution. And even though it's not in the Constitution, and this is where it gets really weird, basically, even though I really shouldn't have taken the case in the first place because I don't have original jurisdiction, I did anyway, and now I'm going to decide that original jurisdiction really shouldn't ever be expanded and that it violates the Constitution. So I'm going to give myself a new power, which is not in the Constitution, to declare laws unconstitutional. Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. He says, he says, look, it, I took an oath to the Constitution, not to the laws passed by Congress. So if there is a distinction between a law passed by Congress and my beloved Constitution, not only did I take an oath to it, but there's a supremacy clause. I'm going to side with the Constitution. I'm not going to enforce a law which I believe is unconstitutional. Because in a sense, why do we have a constitution if we don't have a court which is going to be the judge in a sense? But at the end of the day, what they have done is that they're giving themselves almost law-making powers. We can see judicial review taking action in something like Miranda versus Arizona, where the court creates a rule for policemen to read suspects their rights. Or expanding upon the right to an attorney, where now the state has to pay for an attorney for indigent people. These are all not in the Constitution. The right to an abortion, the right to privacy. There's a tons of rights that come from judicial interpretation. And you can take it or leave it. I don't really care if you such a character. But now you know it. All right, guys, if you haven't checked out Hippie's History, we have a whole bunch of lectures. You should check it out right now and you should subscribe. Because it's so wrong not to at least subscribe, isn't it? Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time. I'm just pressing my pocket. I'm going to side with the Constitution. I'm not going to enforce a law which I believe is unconstitutional. Because in a sense, why do we have a Constitution if we don't have a court which is going to be the judge in a sense? But at the end of the day, what they have done is that they're giving themselves almost law-making powers. We can see judicial review taking action in something like Miranda versus Arizona, where the court creates a rule for policemen to read suspects their rights, or expanding upon the right to an attorney, where now the state has to pay for an attorney for indigent peoples. These are all not in the Constitution. The right to an abortion, the right to privacy, there's a tons of rights that come from judicial interpretation, and you can take it or leave it, I don't really care if you does it down. But now you know it, because you're smarter for it. All right, guys, if you haven't checked out Hippie's History, we have a whole bunch of lectures. You should check it out right now, and you should subscribe. Because it's so wrong not to at least subscribe, isn't it? Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time when you press my buttons. Pirates stalked the seas again, seizing ships and holding cargoes and crews hostage. Strange as it seems, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps were forged over two centuries ago to fight pirates. For hundreds of years, the Barbary pirates, or Corsairs, terrorized the Mediterranean Sea. 
They sailed from ports along the North African coast, taking their name from the Barbary states of Tripoli, Tunis, Algiers, and Morocco. The Muslim pirates sided with the Ottoman Turks against Christian Europe. They preyed on merchant vessels, attacking ships and imprisoning their crews. If no one ransomed captive sailors, the Corsairs enslaved them at hard labor. Barbary pirates raided as far away as England and Iceland, kidnapping villagers to sell in African and Ottoman slave markets. Sometimes, European governments fought the pirates. More often, they paid them bribes, called tribute, to leave their ships alone. But across the Atlantic, a new nation was forming that would challenge the Barbary Corsairs. After Americans threw off British rule, their merchant ships no longer had Royal Navy protection. The Corsairs began to prey on American vessels bound for Mediterranean ports. For the new nation to survive, its goods had to reach market. The U.S. had to protect its commercial fleet. Fresh from British occupation, Americans distrusted the idea of a national military. Many of the Founding Fathers wanted a navy only strong enough to protect American shores. With few warships, the U.S. simply couldn't fight the pirates. In 1784, Congress agreed to spend $80,000 to bribe the Barbary Corsairs. To make the deal, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams sailed to England. In London, the envoys asked Tripoli's ambassador what gave the Barbary states the right to seize American ships and crews. It was the duty of all believers to make war against the unbelievers, the ambassador replied. Any Muslim slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. But he promised them that payments to Tripoli would guarantee safe passage. So America, too, paid tribute. The Corsairs released American captives and agreed to let American ships be. But the attacks continued. As Americans began to lose patience, their leaders debated what to do. Jefferson argued for a stronger navy. It will be more easy to raise ships and men to fight these pirates into reason, he wrote, than money to bribe them. John Adams disagreed. We ought not fight them at all, he said, unless we determine to fight them forever. America resisted a military buildup until bribes to the pirates grew to almost 20% of the national budget. And still American sailors suffered in Barbary prisons. The country's outlook hardened. Congress decided America needed a force that could defend its trade on the world's oceans. In 1794, President George Washington authorized construction of six frigates, long-range attack vessels, fast and well-armed. Each would carry U.S. Marines, a force modeled on British troops stationed aboard warships. Now America would have a fighting navy. In 1801, Jefferson became president. Tripoli immediately tested him. Its ruler, Pasha Yusuf Karamanli demanded more tribute. When Jefferson refused, the Pasha declared war. Only Congress could send Americans into combat. But on his own, President Jefferson ordered U.S. warships to the Mediterranean. After the frigate sailed, he revealed what he'd done. The style of the demand admitted but one answer, Jefferson told Congress. I sent a small squadron of frigates into the Mediterranean. At first, the U.S. Navy fared badly. Corsairs took the USS Philadelphia, imprisoning her crew and sailing the captured frigate to Tripoli. At home, critics savaged Jefferson's foreign adventure. He stayed the course. A turning point came in 1804. In a night raid led by Lieutenant Stephen Decatur, Navy commandos blew up Philadelphia. U.S. warships bombarded Tripoli, wrecking her fortifications. Still, Karamanli refused to release his American captives. 
After a year of fruitless negotiation, the U.S. took action again. William Eaton, American consul to Tunis, assembled a small force of Marines and mercenaries. In April 1805, Eaton marched his troops from Egypt across 500 miles of desert to catch the Pasha by surprise. The Marines recruited the Pasha's enemies, including his brother, then invaded Tripoli. To stay in power, Pasha Yusuf signed a treaty releasing American hostages and promising to end attacks on American ships. The hard line seemed to work. Jefferson told Congress, the states on the Barbary Coast seem generally disposed at present to respect our peace and friendship. But the Corsairs had not ended their attacks. And in 1815, Commodore Stephen Decatur led American fighting men to victory in a second war against the Barbary pirates. This time, the raids stopped for good. The pirate kingdoms were beaten, and a new maritime power had emerged. President James Madison declared, as peace is better than war, war is better than tribute. The United States, while they wish for war with no nation, will buy peace with none. Today's pirates terrorized the seas as the Barbary Corsairs did long ago. With modern weapons and speedboats, they take prizes as large as oil tankers, demanding millions to ransom cargo and crews. Somali outlaws have made the seas off the Horn of Africa the most dangerous in the world, waters through which 30% of the world's oil must pass to reach market. To stop the attacks, a coalition that includes the United States has formed an international task force to patrol the area. And two centuries after American sailors and Marines first made their name fighting the Barbary Corsairs, they face a new generation of pirates on the high seas. 